Good morning, Troy Christian Church. How's everybody doing this morning? We're glad you guys are with us. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're with us. Uh, watching from wherever you are this morning. Uh, we are going to worship our God this morning. And uh, man, it is, it is good to see y'all's faces <laughs> and all, all that statement implies. We're going to worship our God this morning. I want to start us off in prayer. And so if you will just join me this morning. Our Father God, thank you so much for this day. God, thank you for this chance to be here. Thank you for these people, for this family of faith, the chance to be here and worship you this morning. God, we're grateful. Uh, this, uh, this season, this, this past year or more has uh, been uh, challenging in so many ways. And, you know, this is one of those uh, moments where we're, we're kind of returning, I guess, back to some semblance of normal in a way. But God, we know that there's still struggles. There's still uh, very much uh, a reality of this disease out here. And God, we prayed for this past year. We prayed, God, for you to take it away quickly. God, we prayed for uh, all this to just be a moment. God, it wasn't, but God, we, we see in that, that God, you had a plan in all of it. You know, we might've been praying for, uh, God, for patience to deal with uh, everything that we dealt with over the, over the last year. And uh, sometimes happens, we, we had things to be patient for that grew us. God, we prayed and prayed for uh, you to provide for you to take care of us when we were, there were jobs lost, God, when there were uncertain futures, when grocery stores were standing mostly empty. And God, yet we still had some of those times where we got to taste a little bit of that uh, uncertainty and flex a little bit of that muscle that uh, grows us as we rely on you and less on ourselves and God we had this year people that we prayed for that we prayed for healing we prayed for mercy we prayed that they would get better and some did and God we lost friends and we lost family and that is a reality that is hard to face but at the same time God we, we learned that there are times and there are reasons that you understand that we just don't. And so God, we realize that through this last year, we didn't get much of what we uh, wanted necessarily. But God, you gave us everything that we needed. And so we are here a grateful people this morning, a people changed by your mercy, changed by your love and your provision a grateful people that are here to recognize their Savior and give you credit where credit is due. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, we're going to worship our God in song this morning. Just thank him for all that he is, all that he's done for us. And so if you want to stand, you can do that. If you need to sit, just kind of listen, you can do that too. And let's give our God some praise. i 
sin weighed upon your shoulder, my soul now the same. So what can I say? And what can I do? to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures 
that's been reborn Cause love endures forever Sing Turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written. Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? have a seat. We're going to go into a time of communion right now, and uh, hopefully if you're in the room here, you should have gotten the little uh, uh, cup uh, with everything all in it. If you didn't, if you don't mind just raising up your hand right quick, somebody will bring one to you, okay? And if you're at home, uh, if you're watching online, uh, this would be a great time to grab what you need for, for communion, and we'll take it together in just a few minutes here, all right? So, you know, we've already talked about this morning just thinking about as we're praying that this year that we've been through, and every couple of weeks I say, man, what a year it's been. It just keeps moving forward. And we, <laughs> it's been like a year, three years of years at this point, but really for the last, since last spring, spring 2020 uh, with, with COVID and then beyond, right? Like everything that was going on in our world um, in that season and has continued since, it just seems like, um, you know, we, we needed to acknowledge how far we've come, what we've been through, and yet here we stand, here, here we sit together this morning, able to gather together, and not just about, you know, how we don't have to distance, we don't have to wear masks, but we're able to gather, get, gather together this morning because we're alive, because we have the freedom to meet and speak the name of Jesus. We have breath in our lungs, our heart is beating, and so as long as there's breath in us, as long as that heart continues to beat, we have purpose. We have things to accomplish for our life that, that look like us pursuing Jesus, pursuing what it means to be a follower, to live our lives in his example. And so we're going to start this morning just with being thankful and acknowledging how this all began with God giving his only son to sacrifice himself for us. And so I want to start us off in prayer for that and just give you time to talk to God this morning. And if that's something that's new to you, uh, just know that you have a father in heaven who loves you so much, who made you, who already knows what's going on in you, but just wants to have a conversation with you. So if, if prayer is not something that's a regular thing to you yet, just picture you having a conversation with someone who knows you, loves you, just wants to hear your voice. So let me start us off and then we'll take some time to pray. Our Father, we're thankful for this day. God, we're grateful for life, for hope, for another chance, for a start of another day where we can come together, where brothers and sisters gather together to give you praise, to hear from your word and be guided and instructed. God, as we were singing this morning, we have hope that's alive in Jesus Christ, your only son. And so this morning, God, we take time once again just to say thank you for what you've done, for giving Jesus that his sacrifice on the cross, his blood shed would cover our sins. That as he rose from the grave, God, he joins you in heaven and appeals on our behalf. He changes what we know of the world 
around us, the only one to ever rise from the grave. We know and we believe and we have faith that we serve a risen Savior. And so, God, this morning, we just want to be thankful before we go any further, before we try to to even take the, the bread and take the cup and remember what he did. We just want to be thankful for the fact we have the opportunity to choose and not just getting safely to arriving at death and arriving safely at heaven, but God, we get to choose to follow you, to change our life in the here and now. So God, that's why we come here today. And for all these things, we're thankful, God. We take this time just now, each of us, said amen so this morning as we uh, as we continue let's take first the, the bread together remember the broken body of Jesus and then as you're ready let's take the cup remember his blood shed for our sins this morning. God, grateful for your love, grateful for your mercy, grateful for Jesus. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning.
to see everyone here. Uh, we moved our new student and outreach minister, Jonathan and Sydney and Lil Grayson Parrot in yesterday, so we're moving forward in that area, excited about that. You know, one of the fun parts about being in the church and in, in a town for 20 plus years is being able to watch just multiple generations of families grow. Uh, I like to see our young people who, who kind of grew up as young adults and, and next thing we know they're parents, right? Or, or those of us who uh, maybe entered into our time in, in the church as young adults now becoming grandparents, which is more Karen and I's story. And uh, I, I get a weird kind of a kick out of watching our young people look at their parents and say, I'm never going to be like you. And then regretting that I'm becoming like you. And then the satisfaction of the parents as they say, you are like me. And the children that say, you know, there's kind of some qualities about my parents that um, I'm glad that I picked up. You get to see that over generations. It's really fun for me to watch the kids that I've watched over the years roll their eyes as their parents have gone through all the names of, of the kids and the pets and everybody else to get to the right one. Um, and now as those uh, now parents uh, are watching their kids roll their eyes at them as they go through all the names of the kids and the parents until they get to the right one. It's fun. It's also just a joy to watch as um, the people of our church have, have passed faith along from one generation to the next generation and I've watched over the years as so many parents and grandparents have purposefully uh, engaged in a variety of ways to to not only share their life but also to share their faith with the next generation in very meaningful ways so today in our series we're in called family matters we're talking about intentional grandparenting right and the bible has just a whole lot to say about this particular topic it just the bible sets an expectation for parents and grandparents as it relates to their faith so today we're going to unfold some things it says about grandparents a little bit later in our series this month drew's going to unfold for us some things the bible says about parents now if we hope for okay, or even expect to, for the younger generation to engage God, okay, for them to grow spiritually, those of us who are, who are older, okay, relatively speaking, of course, we have got to pass on what we possess. And this really applies both to parents and grandparents, but I just want you to think, like if you are in that role, are you passive or are you passionate about reaching and teaching the next generation as it relates to their faith? Kevin Harper says this, Grandparents are hands down the second most influential people in a child's life. And in many cases, the most significant influence in their lives. And as a result then, when grandparents are intentional, they often make a, a, just a great impact on the next generation. So this morning, I want you to open your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 71. Okay, In the chair in front of you, in that Bible, it's on page 573. Now, sometimes this psalm is referred to as a, a psalm for the aged, right? We believe it's David who was the author, but we know that when he wrote these words, he was in his latter years. He says in verse 9, he, he offers this prayer to God. He says, do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone. So he's older now. He's weaker now. He, he's, he's not the David that we read about who's, who's the conquering king. He's the David who's older. And he says in verse 14, as he's holding on to hope, he writes, as for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. 
So that's the foundation as he's writing these verses. But I want you to look at verses 17 and 18. They kind of are the, the foundation for where we're going today. Give us kind of three different stages in life. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Beginning in verse 17, David writes, Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Throughout the psalm, we see David's overriding concern is that he would live long enough to pass along faith and love to the next generation. He says, to declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. So, Maybe three different lessons kind of tied into seasons of life we look at in those couple of verses there. We'll spend most of our time actually on the third, but I want you to see, first of all, a lesson. And that is this, know God when you're young by learning from Him. Verse 17, David says, since my youth, God, you have taught me. Obviously, youth referring to those early stages of life. Listen, it's it's never too early to teach our children about God. I hope you as parents, grandparents, like that we're taking every opportunity possible to introduce our kids to Jesus, to to teach them with intentionality, not just about the things of life, but the things of eternity as well. I mean, sometimes we wonder, well, how How much can they learn when they're young? Look at David's words. In verses 5 and 6, he says, For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. From birth I have relied on you. You brought me forth from my mother's womb. I will praise you. Listen, we need to purposely invest in those who are young spiritually. And then support and honor what God is doing in their lives. It's, it's a, it, they're on a journey. And they need partners in us to encourage them spiritually as they're learning, as they're growing. And then highlight what God is actually doing in their lives. Paul wrote to Timothy, the books of First and Second Timothy. And to Timothy, who was a young man, who, who was doing things that typically young men didn't do in his culture. And Paul wrote to encourage him. He said this, Don't let anyone look down on you, or on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Encourage that kind of engagement and participation in our young people. And then we, when we see that, to come alongside them, to mentor them even as they're growing in their faith. And they're living it out. As we prioritize this as a church, and we've staffed for this, Becky and Jonathan, our next-gen ministers, specifically have engaged their life and engage us in helping us to disciple this younger generation at home. Right? Now, the second lesson that we learn from these verses is this. Grow in God now by living for Him. And now being the whole operative word in that, in my mind. In the second part of verse 17, David says, To this day, this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. Marvelous meaning something extraordinary. So David is proclaiming God's praises in the past. That was important. But here in his latter years, he's still doing it. He's still engaged in his life with God. You know, the temptation, we see this all the time. The temptation for adults who are in the thick of things as it relates to raising their kids and growing their families and making a living and building a portfolio and dreaming big dreams and preparing for retirement and all those things. They think, you know, I'll I'll get serious about God later. And And I'll spend time, good time with my family later when I'm older. Many of us in, in my generation will remember the song Cats in the Cradle, right? About this, this father, now grandfather, trying to relate to his son. And he wrote these words, or he sings these words in the song. 
I've long since retired and my son's moved away. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle, and the kids have the flu. But it's been sure nice talking to you, Dad. (laughs) It's been sure nice talking to you. As I hung up the phone, it occurred to me. He'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. It's been God's way to grow old, is to develop our walk with him now. And to engage our family now. And to be present with them now. Because you're going to be in the future what you're becoming right now. And if we're not careful, the things we hope to do will never come to pass. Because our kids, they will grow older. (laughs) And they will leave us and they will build a life on their own. And they're building a life like the one they're watching. Do you want them to build a life like the one they're watching? Notice how David, uh, throughout this psalm, if you would read it, is he's like constantly daily devoted to his relationship with God. He speaks of it three different times. In verse 3, he writes, Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Verse 6, he says, I will ever praise you. In verse 14, he says, As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. Listen, King David went through a lot of challenges in his life. We have a lot written about it that we can read, including friction, including fraction, fractures in his family. Remember his son Absalom actually turned on him. Verse 20, he writes this. He says, though you have made me see trouble, God, many and bitter, you will restore my life again from the depths of the earth. You will again bring me David's life, filled with troubles, and yet when you read the things that he wrote on the Psalms, he can never remember a day that the Lord has failed him. Just something to think about. I I sat on Thursday in Fern Metcalf's uh, room over at Troy Care, 98 years old, right? Many of us have heard so many stories from her. I mean, her generation is about gone, and you think about the generations before us that They went through World War I, and they went through the Great Depression, and they went through um, the Spanish flu epidemic, and they went through World War II, and they they went through the severe drought that caused the Dust Bowl, and World War II, and the Korean War, and the Vietnam War, and the Cold War, and, and all of these things. And how many of them, through all that, would tell stories about God's faithfulness, them through all of that craziness and then you think about us and you think about the generations that will follow us who will hear about something called (laughs) COVID-19 and high unemployment and economic uncertainty and, and cultural upheaval and racial tensions and all the things that are going in our world today and just like the older generations experienced rough and sometimes terrible times, we will have stories about some rough and pretty terrible times ourselves and how they've marked our life. And the question is, like, in what way are we trusting God right now during these troubling times? And what lessons will we be able to pass along to the generations that will follow about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God and the strength of God and the works of God in times that are very crazy. I appreciate the insight of an author named Keith Matheson. He wrote a post called, It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. (laughs) Here's what he says. When unbelievers look at followers of Jesus during times of upheaval and suffering that occur in every generation, let them not see people who are as anxious and as scared and as panicked as they are. Let them see those who confidently trust their sovereign and holy God come what may. Let them see a people who have the true peace of God that passes all understanding. Let them see us showing love to both God and neighbors who remain faithful 
to the task to which God has called us. Let them see the light in this darkness. Let them see Jesus in our lives right now. The third lesson that we see um, here in Psalm 71 in these verses is this. Show God in your later years by leaving a legacy. This is the force of what David is writing throughout this whole psalm. He not only looked back to God's goodness and faithfulness since birth, but he was living out on a daily basis that faith. And, And when he looked to the future, not knowing how much future there was, he knew there was a job to be done. Look again at verse 18. He says, even when I am old and gray, Maybe he's thinking, even though I'm old and gray, I'm not sure. But either way, he says, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Like David had witnessed the wonder of God, and he had witnessed the works of God. And he was determined to declare that message to the ones who would follow him. And you get a sense when you read Psalm 71 that he's doing such with with kind of a life and death urgency because he knows that he's going to pass. He's determined to pass along God's actions and God's attributes. And that's exactly what we should be doing with an intentional urgency, declaring who God is and declaring what God has done in us and through us. Like, it's just interesting. Old age doesn't provide an out for David. Instead, it actually does just the opposite. So that the older we get, the greater the urgency we should feel to intentionally impact the next generation. Knowing that our time is getting shorter, and so might our influence as well. Many of you would recognize the name John Wesley. He was a, an evangelist in years, years past, and, but he served God into his senior years. It's said that during his lifetime, he was an itinerant preacher, meaning he, he rode from place to place to preach. It's, it's said that he rode 350,000 miles on horseback in his lifetime, and that he preached 40,000 different sermons in his lifetime. Now, that might be hard to believe unless you read some things that he wrote himself. For example, when he was 83, he complained because he only had 15 hours a day to study the Word of God. (laughs) At 86, he was frustrated that maybe he was becoming slothful because he was sleeping in till 5 a.m. I don't know what you would call me if that's that's slothful. (laughs) At, At age 87... He learned his 11th foreign language. At age 88, he was again frustrated because he saw himself diminishing. He was now only able to preach twice a day, six days a week (laughs) at age 88. Listen, biblically understood, by him and by us, a longer life is an opportunity for extended ministry impact. He didn't reach 65 and shut it down. At 88, he was frustrated that he was shutting down, that his body was actually shutting down. In Psalm 71, David is saying, God, please sustain my life long enough that I can leave a legacy of faith to the next generation. He wasn't just thinking about coasting in to the last season of life. He's determined to declare his faith to those who follow after him and provides us a great example. It's said that the Christian church is ever only one generation away from extinction. If we don't pass it along, then it will die. And, and I think that that theme of one generation passing faith to the next generation, of parents and grandparents continuing that legacy of faith, it's all throughout Scripture. Let me read you three different passages that are positive in this way and one that's negative. Deuteronomy 4.9 reads like this. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. 
Be careful, listen, be careful to protect your own soul so that you don't lose your love for the Lord and don't lose your godly witness and then pass that along to your children and to your grandchildren. We spend a lot of time, we're talking about family in Deuteronomy chapter 6, often in the verses that come after this, but look at verses 1 and 2. Moses writes, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Listen, when I fear God, when I honor God, then I am in a position to reflect him to the next generation. In Psalm 78, just a few pages over from where we're at this morning, listen to these first seven verses from Psalm 78. The psalmist writes, My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God. And would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Do you see the pattern? Better question. Do you feel the responsibility? This is God's purpose in parenting. And it's his purpose in grandparenting. And yet there's this tension. I have watched, and maybe you have too, as over the years, there's just this almost taking for granted that because I have faith, my kids will have faith. And because I have faith, my grandchildren will have faith. It just somehow passes along, and yet it doesn't always work that way. And certainly without intentionality, it's very unlikely that it will work that way. Now in the book of Judges, chapter 2, we see the danger of what happens when you just assume that faith will move from one generation to the next. And, And it might even be a a prophetic state of the church today, if we're not careful. Judges 2, beginning in verse 6, we read these words. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Look at verse 10. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their parents or their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. I think it's one of the saddest legacy verses in all of the scripture. I mean, this generation that had seen God do incredible things failed to pass that awe of God, that faith in God, that love for God on to the next generation. So you ask the question, so what? Like, that's the question I ask when I'm writing sermons each week. And having sit in those chairs many times, that's sometimes the, the question that I'm asking when I sit in those chairs. So what? What, what do I do with this? Um, I would just encourage us, like in, in a society that increasingly undervalues and increasingly marginalizes people as they age, how does that impact our thoughts and our lives? How should we live when society is moving in that direction. There's an author, his name is Josh Mulvihill, and, and he, in his writings, he's a speaker and author, and in his studies of the culture, he says he feels like there's two messages 
that grandparent aged people in our society consistently get from our society. And the first is this. The first message is stay out of the way. It's a message of inconvenience. When grandparents, though, think they're an inconvenience, are made to feel that way, they may choose to live a life that's independent of their children and independent of their grandchildren. I see it happening a lot in our culture. Watch people that as they age, they feel more isolated, more sidelined, uh, more demoted, if you will, more, more past their prime and beyond their usefulness. And it's just this message that gets communicated of, yeah, you used to be useful, but not so much anymore. And if we're honest, like that's just not always coming from the younger generation. It's not always their fault. Because sometimes we watch as Middle-aged adults, broad range, right? Middle-aged adults um, leave their families. Maybe not literally, but relationally they leave them. They leave them to build. They leave them to grow their own lives and their careers without truly engaging their families. It's as if they're pursuing their own interests. And they're surprised later in life when they want a seat at the table that they haven't earned because they checked out and they find that their families in those seasons of life often love them out of duty and not out of devotion. They love them because they have to, not necessarily because they want to or because it's the right thing to do more than it is their heart's desire. And that that relational distance in families oftentimes just so heartbreaking to watch. Sometimes these adults, older, find themselves abandoned altogether. So combat this inconvenience mentality that we find in our society by engaging kids and grandkids, by continuing to add value to their life, purposely staying connected in their lives, like David modeled for us here in Psalm 71. Well, Mulva Hill said there's a second message that he finds um, being conveyed to grandparent age people in our society. He said, and it's this, travel and play. Okay? It's a message of indulgence. Just travel and play. You've earned it. Okay? You've worked hard. You've done your time. Now you get to have fun. Now you get to travel. Now you get to play. Now you get to whatever, rest. Okay? Now, as you might expect, Karen and I saw a lot of this in southwest Florida, where we live. A lot of people, because the population was slanted toward the older adults, and many of them, they they had nice houses, and they had nice cars, and many had nice bank accounts, and they had a lot of leisure time, but I can tell you they also had a lot of regret. Some regretted um, the relational distance in their families that was born out of a life that produced a good income, and in some cases it produced wealth, but it often left them bankrupt relationally as it came to their family. Like their family once felt like an inconvenience to them, and now their family was just repaying the favor. Others taught their families to indulge in their lives. And what they found is that the next generation followed their example, and they indulged. And the third generation followed their example, and they indulged. They just all indulged in different ways, and therefore, they were all just missing each other. Values were passed down for sure, but God was not a part of the picture. And therefore, toward the end, he wasn't part of the picture of their family. And that's what drove the regret. John Piper uh, shared what I think just this, this unforgettable illustration one time in, in a message he was preaching. He said, I'll tell you what tragedy is. And he pulled a page from the Reader's Digest. He said, Bob and Penny, he said, they, they were successful and they took early retirement. Five years ago, he said, Bob was 59 and Penny was 51 and 
And now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida. Well, that's right where we were living, just, just south of, we were just north of Punta Gorda. He says, and they spend their time cruising on their 30-foot trawler, and they play softball, and they collect shells. He said, that's a tragedy. He said, when you stand before the creator of the universe, and you give an account for what you did, are you going to look at him and say, here it is, Lord, my shell collection. Don't waste your life. Intentionally live out your faith. Whatever whatever age you were at. Today we're talking about the grandparents, right? And I would tell you, though, we see both of those things in Florida and in Ohio, right? But I would also tell you that it doesn't describe all of the older adults in our culture, either in Florida or here. Karen and I met some incredible people who were followers of Jesus in their older years. And instead of seeing themselves as an inconvenience, or instead of getting swallowed up in indulgence, they forged a third alternative, and I I would just call it engagement. They lived a life of intentionality. The Bible calls us to be intentional if indeed we are going to make a spiritual impact on the next generation. And we knew and know and marvel at a lot of adults who are older than we are. Who are very intentional about their lives. And it describes some of the people at Troy Christian Church as well. God places expectations on us as his people, on us as grandparents and parents to to teach the word of God, to give testimony to what God has done in our lives and through our lives. We're to share the scripture and to reinforce their relevance by how we live and what we say consistently across the board as best as us fallible people can do. Now, I want to close with just a dose of reality. Okay, C.T. Studd was a, a preacher years ago, and, and he just penned these words that uh, they ring so loudly in my years and have for some time. He said this. He said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray together. Oh, the words of that statement are true, Father you have indeed called us as your people to live lives of significance, to be the key to the next generations that will follow, knowing you and being connected to you because we know you. We have observed your wonders. We have felt the transformation in our own lives personally because we've engaged you. May we engage and stay engaged with our family and those people you put in our life so that at the end of this life we may have trophies of your grace to present to you just because we lived a life that honored you. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's a tough challenge and certainly one that we are not capable of accomplishing on our own. We need God's help. The beautiful part about God is that his mercies are new every day. And some of us have tried our best to this point to live the life that honors God. And and today, God gives us strength for this day to do that very thing, to live a life consistent what we say and what we do so that people of our generation and the ones to come have a look at what God can do with just a messed up and broken life. Sometimes we need a fresh start, and if today you need a fresh start, God will give you that. We'd love to talk with you about that or pray with you about that. I'm just going to step over to the side. If you want to come and and talk or pray through that, uh, grab one of our leaders, one of our staff members. We'd love to do that with you. Let's all stand together. I give myself away. myself away so you can use me I give myself away I give myself away so you can use me here I am here I stand Oh
is not my own to you I belong I give myself I give myself to you give myself away. life is not my own to you I belong I give myself I give myself to you I give myself Guys, we're so glad that you were with us today here in the room or watching on the stream. We're glad to get to worship with you. So the invitation doesn't stop there. If you need to talk with us, pray with one of us, uh, just need support through whatever you're going through, feel free to catch one of us here after service. We'll meet you out in the lobby as well. And uh, you can always catch us through the week, email, call, text, smoke screen. <laughs> Whatever it takes, stop on in. We'll talk with you, pray with you, all right? We love you guys. You have a blessed day.